Hello, I'm Derek Smalls, and you're watching or listening or both to Rock Shop Live with Eric Broadbent. He's the Bent Broad. You're watching Rock Shop Live, brought to you by Stewart Travel Guitars. See the incredible guitar at StewartGuitars.com. Microphones for Rock Shop Live are provided by Rode Microphones. Now, for Music Gear Network, here's your host, guitarist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, happy Friday to you all. Welcome to The Rock Shop. We are live once again. We hope everyone is well and joining us here for the first time on the program. Nice to bring him on to the show uh, from Los Angeles, California, composer of the music that uh, I'm sure you love and know from hits Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, El Camino, uh, a preacher, the blacklist. I mean, the the list. It's in the description. The IMDb list is crazy. Uh, but we're going to break some bad tonight with Dave Porter. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Eric. Oh, it's a pleasure. The pl the thanks are all ours, especially over in the chat as well too. We've been lucky for the. Like, we usually talk rock and roll stuff here on the thing with uh, with rock artists and things of that nature, but. I'm a, a rock artist or fan of TV, and the last little bit we've been talking some Better Call Saul with some of the cast, and uh, I, people have been loving it. So we got some regulars over in the chat. We'll say hi to them uh, throughout the evening. But, you know, more importantly than Better Call Saul and more important than Emmys and Golden Globes and all this kind of cool stuff is health and safety. So how are you and the family at home? Doing well? Oh, thank you. Yes, we are. We're in our bubble. We've been uh, very diligent about it. Haven't gone anywhere, which is not unusual for me. I, I live here and my studio is in my house. Right. So it's not unusual for me not to venture out too often. But uh, it's definitely been, uh, you know, uh, more of a more of a ding on the kids. But uh, they're hanging in there and we're, we're doing well. We're very lucky considering. That's good. Well, it's, it's funny because you mentioned like, you know, you work from home, you know, and so you're the kind of the. Uh, uh, I don't want to say antisocial, but you're home all the time, right? You're, you're locked into the kind of the dungeon oh. of the studio. So you've been training for this for years, haven't you? That's right. <laughs> this is, uh, I, I, it took me a few weeks to realize anything was going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, un you unlocked that achievement award years ago. That's right. That's awesome. <laughs> well, as we get through the program here, one of the cool things that, um, and I was telling you off here how my son influenced me with certain types of music that, uh, you know, he's into that I would never have discovered. And I was really surprised to find out at a very young age uh, you know, long, I know you're younger than me, but, um, long before the tools were available to us that we have today for electronic music, that was something that inspired you. Tell us how you got into electronic music and maybe, uh, some of the, you know, artists that influenced you in that genre. Yeah, I was really lucky, I think, to, uh, grow up where I did and, and sort of suburban land, uh, outside of Washington, DC and was are surrounded in, in, in that kind of, uh, 70s way that you just don't you hear old folks like us talk about but uh of kids that were like you know running around neighborhood to neighborhood for miles and and uh, i played and hung out with kids much older than i was uh and uh and they were in turn uh, always exposing me uh to music that i didn't hear at home uh, my folks were very classically based. They listened to classical music almost exclusively, mm -hmm. uh, especially during that time. So I listened to a lot of classical music at home, but all the rock and roll came from the cool kids around the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, that that ran the gamut from everything from from classic rock, but also to, you know, the emerging synth pop of the early 80s. And, uh, you know, I, I vividly remember hearing uh, my first Prince record. Okay. Uh, my first uh, Howard Jones record. Uh, you know, I mean, there's just real, uh, real innovators at the time. Uh, and I guess I was lucky too to be growing up at an era where that technology was really exploding with computers and MIDI and uh, keyboards. And, you know, I was a teenager when all that started. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was out there mowing lawns to buy gear and like most you know kids i knew my age and uh, that's that's what sort of launched my interest in in making my own music well that's cool too because i mean you're out there you're working it like you're not just asking mom and dad buy me this and buy me that you know like <laughs> you know do, like van halen brothers you know doing paper routes you know pay off stuff right. that's cool right. and, and it makes you really value like let's say you're trying to buy the first piece of software or maybe a special keyboard or something you really value that because you worked for it 
Yeah, I was trying to explain to someone younger than I am recently that, you know, maybe it's of our generation, but I mean, I measured uh, the amount of work I had to do in the CDs I could buy or the vinyl I could buy yeah. even. Right. With exactly. how many how many lawns did I have to mow? Right. To <laughs> to, to buy this new CD or a, or a new keyboard or whatever it was. That's right. That, that's the good, currency of the day. Good measurement. Good measurement. OK, so I get the new Prince album. It's going to take me the Jones's the Jones's lawn. Uh, the, that's you know, right. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Right. Very cool. Let's go over and say hi to a bunch of cool people for a second. I'm going to be looking off camera here because I'm using my chat over on a different computer tonight. Uh, Landshark Mark is here, one of our good friends. Uh, Race Grooves, he has a really cool YouTube channel. It's crazy. I'm, he does like a Hot Wheels stuff. Your kids might like that. You, the ages that you told me. Oh, yeah. I'll send you the link after. It's Hot Wheels stuff. Very cool. I'm not sure if they're into that. Uh, Edwin Crane is here. Paul Sura is a, a big time fan in the uh, Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad universe. Uh, Patrick Fabian knows him really well. Some of the cast knows him. He's here. He says, no coming in late today. I'm ready for this one. Awesome. There's no penalty for being late. You just have to, uh, uh, you have to stand in the corner for a couple of minutes. Uh, all right. All right. Landshark Mark. Uh, let me see. Edwin Crane is here. The party line is my beautiful Sandra Lee. She'll be sharing uh, links to your various uh, social media profiles, uh, your website and things like that throughout the evening. And, uh, and there's also links in the description as well to all your uh, properties too. Guitar Man 45 is here. Um, let me see here. Uh, see if I miss him. Brad Miller's jumping in. They're very, very mm -hmm. nice. And Paul saying hello to everybody as well. So going back to the electronic music, I mean, you know, some of the stuff where you're getting in was you were kind of coming in at the cusp of things growing. You know, MIDI it was pop well, MIDI's been popular forever, but you know, some of the you know looping softwares and things like that. Can you did you ever foresee what we would have available to us today? Huh. No, I mean, I don't think I was a you know wise enough to view how far ahead it would all be. Uh, I mean, I think I I, I incrementally could see it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that I could have said, you know, 25 years ago, we'd be where we are now, uh, particularly, I think, with the with the involvement of the computers in particular. Like when I was getting into it, you know, everything was a standalone piece of gear. You had sequencers, you had keyboards, you had and all these things, interfaced samplers and all that. And uh, and it would the computer and then that those first ver early versions of Pro Tools were really something I couldn't have imagined and, and changed everything so fast. I, I agree. Well, that's the thing too. Like when you talk about like in the guitar community, you know, we would have like us as guitar players would have a rack unit as a chorus. We'd have a rack yep. unit as a delay, you know, and so on and so forth. And um, yeah. I'm using two cameras here tonight. So you may not be able to see this or not. I'm using a really poor camera for you to see me just so you know, I'm, we're here and we're on the air and I'm using a better camera for the audience, but you may be able to see behind me. I'm using line six stuff, uh, line six helix. And I've sure. been an, I've been an analog guy for my entire life, you know. And I replaced it all, all the amps, all the racks, all the pedals with one device. Yeah. yeah. And the effort. I mean, think about the effort and the gear you had to have, right? All in sequential chain to get that sound, mm -hmm. right? And and now it's so much simpler. That's right. I said this the other night. I did a live jam on uh, Wednesday night. And I was telling people, I said, you know, back in the day, and when I say back in the day, it's only like six years ago when, when I would play or when any of us go out and play when we can play again, you know, that cool factor of walking in with, you know, four 412 cabinets and all this crazy back line and smoke machines and all this other kind of stuff. That's cool right. at front at first until you got to tear right. that stuff down at the end of the night, you know? Right. So walking in with a, a bag with a modeler in one hand and a guitar in the other hand, I mean... You know, you're back and that will thank you at the end of the night. Cool is one thing, but uh, efficiency is another. Yes. For sure. So for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me see here. What was the next thing I was going to go to? Um, so the, one of this is a question. Next week as well, too, we've got Ronit Kirchman coming on. Uh, I think she, she works with the same uh, um, agencies that you do. And we're looking yep. forward to talking to her and she's probably a colleague of yours in the industry. Um, and this is a question I definitely want to ask her as well, too. Because sure. it, it, it's it's crazy sometimes how what goes into some of these productions. And I'd like to ask, like, when do you know, for some of these hits that you write for the shows, when do you know, okay, I've got enough, uh, I've, or I've got too much, or I need more for a song? Like, going into it, when do you know you've got the, like, make, making a, a, a cake with the right recipe, the right ingredients, when do you walk away from it? You're talking about orchestrationally? Yeah, yeah. Like, to make up a word? I mean, yeah. Like, when, when do you know how many tracks are enough tracks? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I'd be really curious, actually, uh, uh, about how uh, Ronit answered this because she's she's uh, very well spoken and very talented composer. 
I, for me, uh, it's I've I've had different periods. I think in my career when I measured that, early in my career in New York when I was before I was doing TV stuff, but I was doing mostly uh, commercials and promos for TV. We we had a rule that if there was a fader that was still down, there was more writing to do. <laughs> they couldn't couldn't be full enough and big enough, but. You know that's a very specific world, right? Where yeah. you're where you're out there to uh, to kick butt and and really make people take notice in a very short amount of time. Uh, I'm very much not that way now, uh, and I, you know, it's a great question. I'm not sure I'm ever fully satisfied with the answers to that. Um, I work a lot um, and I add things and then I subtract things. And then I subtract more things and then maybe add more. It's, it's a constant evolution. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm ever totally sure I'm totally right <laughs> with, wh- with where we are. But I will say that more often than not, subtraction is the answer rather than addition. OK. You know, I mean, if, if I'm particularly if I'm stuck or I feel like something's not working, uh, my first instinct is not to add is to take something out. That makes sense. Uh, and even, even if I think it's really great, uh, because, I, you know, for, for, for whatever reason, it's not gelling with the other parts or it's just not it's not it's not greater than the whole and it needs to go. Right. That's that's the thing, right? It's like uh, the, each one of these tracks is like a, a baby to you. And, you know, OK, it's got to be perfect. And I know creative people are never 100 percent satisfied. No, it's hard, and it's it's hard. I never listen to my music when it's on broadcast on the air. Uh, very rarely, because for for one thing, it doesn't sound as good as the last time I hear it on the mix stage. Yeah. So I like to I like to leave myself with the memory of how it's how it sounded on the on the mix stage in a professional environment. Uh, but also, yeah, because you just uh, it's I think it's uh, a second nature, at least for me. I mean, I can't speak for all people who do this, but. Um, you know, I, I'm always second guessing myself and wondering, oh, well, I could have tried this or I could have done that. And, uh, and, you know, particularly in TV, um, the turnaround times are so brutal, uh, and the pace at which you have to commit to things is so fast, uh, that it's, it's inevitable that you, you had, you come around sometimes and second guess yourself. Well, this isn't a question I had on the itinerary, but you kind of uh, led into a, a interesting topic. How much time do you have? Let's say for let's say Better Call Saul, for example. Um, yeah. Like, do you do you provide music as they're as they're writing like a couple episodes, give them a couple, then they continue on. You get a couple more. Or do you have to get it all up front in front of the season? How does that work? Well, it does vary from show to show. But if we're talking about the the Vince Gilligan shows and and Better Call Saul, Breaking Bad, those because those uh, because Vince and Peter Gould who created Saul because those guys are so involved in every step of the process from writing to production to post, Mm -hmm. um, they have to be there for each of those physically there. Wow. So, so if they're writing, they're here, if they're shooting, they're in Albuquerque for quite a while. And then when we're in post, they're here in, in LA with us and we're turning around episodes every week, just as fast as people will watch them. So I get it. Uh, you know, and then have, we have, a what's called a spotting session where mm-hmm. we all sit down together and talk about it, uh, sort of create a game plan for how we're going to use music and where, what kind of music it's going to be. Is it going to be, uh, music that I'm writing, uh, original to the show, or is it a licensed piece of music, right? That our music supervisor, uh, Thomas Golovich would be dealing with. And then we, uh, and then we sort of launch our separate ways and I have three or four days maybe to write. Usually, and then a, then I present it, and then a day for some revisions and some tweaks, and then it's on the mix stage, and I'm on to the next one. Wow, are, are you given um, like any kind of like an animated storyboard or a script or or things like that, or is it just kind of you give me a scene idea and you got in the time frame roughly, and you come up with that? You know, by the time I get working on these things, I'm usually watching something that's almost done. Oh wow, music and sound are pretty much last in the process. Uh, and, uh, just because of the pace at which it moves, um, especially later on in the season, by the time I've gotten backlogged like that, I probably haven't seen much of it before we sit down to watch it and I start working on it. 
Jeez. And part of me really loves that, honestly, because I'm so lucky to be last. I get to see all the hard work and the amazing decisions that have been made before me in the writer's room, on the script, down to the performances, the lighting, how it's been edited. All those things factor into how I'm inspired to score something. Uh, so it's a really wonderful benefit uh, to be able to sit down and honestly watch it like a fan, mm -hmm. not know what's going to happen. Uh, and and the, especially that very first time I get to watch it, taking notes, and I get to really have a visceral reaction to the show like like anyone would. Uh, and that helps me sort of navigate where I think music should go and, and what role I think it should play. That's nice because it is nice to actually be a fan. Like uh, when you when the day is done, you know, and that at least yeah. that job is done, you can be a fan and it kind of, you know, and I've seen you do the red carpet walks with all the cast and crew, and it's probably very cool to sit back, have a cocktail, whatever it may be, and mm -hmm. w enjoy the moment with the, you know, the premiere. And then, of course, I know you say it, it never sounds as good as it does in the studio, and that's of course, but, you know, some theaters might sound okay. And uh, yeah. also, boom, there's the crashes and the scores and, and the, the, you know, the, the emotional element on screen. It must be pretty cool to take that in even at that time, too, even though it's not as, it, the quality is not the same, but the moment's cool. Oh, it's wonderful, especially when we get together like that for the premieres and things, because we are we're we're all over the place. We don't interact as much as we would like, uh, but we've all have been working together, most of us, for years and years and years. Uh, so it's it's always great when we're together, and uh, you know, it it would be easy having done what six up six seasons of Breaking Bad and coming up on the sixth season of Better Call Saul to, to you know, not be as excited about those things. But I, I am. I always am. I, I love it. And um, it's it's part of what motivates me to to do it. Well, I find the same thing. I find the consistency with all the cast and crew, you know, from from Peter and Thomas uh, I mean, and all the all the actors on screen. Uh, but I mean, everybody that's involved with the production, uh, obviously Vince himself too, but everyone is, is a fan of the show. In, you know, I mean, it's their show they've created, you all create it, but they're still fans. I mean, even if a character gets killed off, they still watch the show religiously. There's a real family camaraderie between everybody. Yeah, and that comes from Vince, I think, and and everybody at the top on down, um, because uh, because their their excitement is is always palpable. Uh, and they're and they're so uh, I think inclusive uh, of everyone who works on the show and and everyone's opinions uh, from the top executive producer you know down to the you know the newest office helper you know every everybody's everybody's part of the team and they, and they really do uh, foster and add that environment uh, which makes it so much fun and and creatively you know when you're in that situation. The last thing you want to be, right, is 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 the is the the the, the weakest spoke of the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> so it pushes everybody too in a in a very positive way. Um, I think to uh, to do better each season, uh, and I and I think that's that's where that the, that inherent drive for quality comes from. That that is really awesome. I'm glad you also mentioned uh, one of your buddies that you work with very closely, uh, Thomas Glubik. Uh, for people in the Walking Dead world, I'm I'm a huge Walking Dead fan as well too. Sadly, this long break that they've you know we're, we're forced upon with with the pandemic, you know, we didn't get a season finale yet, which obviously we, uh, understandable. But yeah. people in the Walking Dead world would know. Uh, well, maybe they don't know Thomas, but Super Music Vision, uh, a great. Uh, uh, did I say that right? Super Music Vision. That's his company name, isn't it? Yeah, right. It is. Yeah. So Music Supervision, but in Super Music Vision, uh, he's kind of the person chief and the chief uh, person looking after all the music wheelhouse of Walking Dead. And he's uh, the reason I discovered him. He, uh, he, I was turned on to him by a good friend of mine, Glenn Mazzara. Uh, Glenn uh, was uh, the showrunner for Walking Dead at the end of season two ish. Yeah, you, you know him. Yeah, yeah very, sure, very well. Numbers. And yep. the, he did a really nice panel. He hosted a uh, Writers Guild panel. I don't even know how long ago it was. I'm gonna, I think it was probably t towards the end of Breaking Bad. But he, uh, Glenn was the host of a panel and he had Peter and Vince and all the writers. It was a really good panel. Very cool. Mm. But the reason why I asked that question earlier about, and the thing I was going to mention to Ronit next week as well too, and this goes back to my son, you know, talking about these these different pop artists and that. And and here again, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to sound hip, and I'm not trying to sound cool because I'm neither of the two. Um, but there's this hip hop artist, um, a Little Pump. I guess he was a SoundCloud rapper for a while, and then he just blew up. And uh, there's this, he did this one song, and I'm going to probably pronounce it wrong. It's called Eskeet It or something like that. But forgive me, rappers and, and hip hops. I don't know the the lingo. I'm sorry. 
Um, I get it. It's cool. But um, it's it, uh, he. there's a video on YouTube, and the, the producer's name was CB Mix. That's what he goes by. And he broke down everything that went into this hit song. And when I, when I say it's hit, it was a big, a big, big song. And sure. using Fruity Loops, and, and that's what my son uses as well, too, and he produces some great music. But there were mm-hmm. six key elements in there. And, you know, that was it. And it was so cool also. He was showing some things in there. Some things were just, like, totally stuck. And he showed this piano that would, he played it, and he even said it sounded like absolute garbage. But it on, inside the song, it, it right. was magic. So I guess, right. in long story short, what I was going for is sometimes too much can be too much, right? For sure. And and it's all about, uh, it, it, as you just pointed out, I think it's all about how the, how the sounds interact with each other. Uh, I mean, I've, I've often find, especially now, if you, uh, as a composer, you're relying on um, a lot of modern instruments. Um, they're so high fidelity, right? And they're so thick and they're so lush. Uh, and they take up so much sonic real estate that uh, two or three of those in, in a track will, will wipe you out. There's just no room for anything else. And so part of what I have learned over time to do with all that stuff is just sculpt it down using EQ or or whatever else just to just to give it its its special place in the mix. Right. Mm hmm. Uh, so that it plays its role and hopefully not more than its role. That, um, that because, uh, because rightly so, I think if, if, if you, you, you can have a, you can have 20 amazing parts, um, uh, but if they're all jumbled together and you're not making out any of it, then it's of no use. Right. I agree. I agree. I got to say one thing, one of the links we'll have in our description as well, too, we do have is to your Spotify and over the past couple of days, um, you know, getting into the, the you know, prep and, and the zone for tonight. I've been listening to your Spotify and I kept calling uh, Junior in here, Eric Junior. I was like, come on, listen to this, come and listen to this one. Remember this from the scene? And it was just, it's so nice. I mean, just, you know, we've watched these shows. A lot of people in the in the fandom out there, you know, they, like to me, to me here in this house, uh, the Breaking Bad universe is like Star Wars. Are you a Star Wars fan? <laughs> Yes, that's a high compliment. I appreciate that. Okay. But yes, and uh, and I've been reliving it recently with my son, which has been a lot of fun. Isn't that cool? It's things. Yeah, it's such a cool thing yeah. to have it come around, you know, again. Well, to be honest, though, uh, it's Star Wars and Breaking Bad um, universe are the same is the same popularity here in the household. So what I'm what I'm trying to say with that is that, you know, listening to the tunes, you know, just re- reliving it. And last night I was kind of sharing some things on Twitter you might even saw. Like I, I watched the one, like on the top of your Spotify, there's, I'm not sure how Spotify works. I'm on Spotify, but I don't even know how to work it. There's like four of the main songs and then you have like your albums you can choose. So, you know, if you've got the Breaking Bad, um, you know, extended theme, which, you mm-hmm. you know, you would hear like at the end, the season finale when, you know, Walt's, you know, dying there. Yeah, that's extended out through the credits. Really cool. And a couple other songs. Mm-hmm. And then there's uh, the border crossing, and oh. so nice, nice, you know, uh, you know, calypso kind of, you know, really fun vibe. And then I started watching that scene again, and I realized that they pretty much did that whole scene in one shot. And and you know, the you put the two universes together. I mean, they could have used anything music wise, and it wouldn't have had the same feel. But they and the shots were good. But using your theme for that, it's just like it was magical. Oh well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know the the that you as a composer you don't often get moments like that one um where you're not competing against some much more uh complicated story or or dialogue or uh action right this this was this was a story that was told uh from the camera and and through through the whole the vibe of the whole uh the way it was presented and uh, we talked an awful lot about that moment. And, you know, it was unusual for us a little bit. Uh, this is in Better Call Saul, by the way, for folks who haven't seen it. Um, and it was a teaser. It was the way it opened up uh, one of the episodes. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a chance for us to be a little uh, almost jaunty, a little like uh, tongue in cheek with it. And... Uh, if there's anything we love in in the Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul universe, it's it's uh, it's criminals getting away with stuff. Yeah, <laughs> criminals being clever. Yeah, uh, and this this was a great example of that, and uh, uh, it was it was super fun to do. 
and and a chance for me to you know step outside a little bit of the usual score for the show uh and and to your point earlier a chance to to create a track that was a little fuller that had a lot more in it live horns and um a, a, a lot of thicker orchestration that i could get away with in that instance because that was what all you were really hearing i mean there's some sound design you know, the trucks and the mm-hmm. various things going on, but nothing that was so crucial you had to hear it. So the music, I knew the music would be nice and prominent in that moment. And of course, as a composer, you want to dedicate as much time as you can to those moments where you're, where you get to be in, in the, in the, uh, in the front seat. Exactly. I mean, it, it fits so well. I mean, that could have been what uh, he was listening to in the truck driving. It could, you know, it could have just been the soundtrack, but I mean, it's, it fit no matter how you were to possibly, put that song in and it could have been anywhere right but it just fit yep. yeah that's awesome uh we have a super chat from metalhead hippie and he says uh, eric what does dave think of billy eilish bad guy song um let me see his favorite pop rock metal industrial bands uh so okay so kind of two questions in one so what, what do you think of right. billy eilish well, i can't say i'm super familiar okay. with the uh, the current pop stuff uh, I but I, I know certainly who Billie Eilish is she's an amazing voice uh, and I do think uh, you know that this I, I, part of being around the uh, being around the, the, the earth long enough right is you start to see cycles yep. uh, of, of how things go and you, you see how music production builds itself up and builds itself up and gets more and more polished and more and more you know let's be honest uh similar <laughs> yeah you know? and and then somebody comes along and strips it all down right and and gets to something that's very bare and and emotionally strong mm-hmm. uh and has great conviction about it uh and uh i think that you know she absolutely falls into that category um and uh she's really cool i've been encouraging my, my son's a little young still uh for for that stuff but i've been encouraging that's one of the artists i've encouraged him to look into for sure nice well i i mean myself i'm 52 years old uh, i i'm an older guy and i like her a lot thanks to my son i mean i i yeah. if i turn i can listen to the whole album and i don't want to turn it i think she's really good i think she's uh very fresh and that's the thing we the only it's very rare for something to stand out on the radio these days and uh you know if well, well, what's that you know and that's nice when that happens it doesn't happen very often true yeah true, for sure true. And he had kind of several other questions, but we can probably lump it into one. So he was asking a favorite pop, rock, and metal artist. But maybe we can just uh, simplify it like this. Um, maybe some bands that you listen to. Uh, maybe you have a shuffle list yourself, or maybe you're in the car. Uh, who are some of the artists that get some play that you like a lot? Uh, you know, I go through waves, I think, uh, of things. I, I, uh, I don't listen to as much new music as I should, mm-hmm. which is probably the curse of of most folks as they get older uh but um lately uh i have been listening to a lot of prog rock uh, both new and old or relatively new and old um you know we were talking earlier before we went on about rush i've been listening to a lot of rush lately i love tool i listen to a lot of tool and um porcupine tree if anybody's out there is into you know very interesting uh prog rock i recommend uh porcupine tree i don't think i've heard them what, what's what's uh, your yeah, big thing you check them out. uh they're english and you know i don't, actually don't think they exist currently okay uh, but uh but they put out a bunch of records and uh okay. i have some some good friends from my days in new york who worked in in the label business and they turned me on to them a long time ago and so th- they've been a influence on me for sure nice um trying to think uh you know and then as you get into the more i think people think of me as 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 uh doing a lot of stuff with sound design and keyboards and stuff like that certainly um the wax track stuff from the 80s and 90s was a big deal to me um skinny puppy Okay. Canadian bands there for you. Yeah. All right. And uh, we're, we're, you know, very uh, definitely opened a lot of doors for me musically. Uh, and then I also grew up um, just outside of Washington, D.C., which uh, when I was growing up uh, had had a very vibrant uh, punk rock scene and post punk scene that that uh, was uh, certainly influential to me as well. That's awesome. I'm getting a couple of feedback uh, from people as well, too. Fred Siegel and uh, who else mentioned it as well? 
Uh, Ed B says, yeah, porcupine trees. So, so they know them and love them from what they're saying. So this is one of the nice things. Uh, sometimes this happens. It happens more often than not on the show. We discover sometimes people will come in and they don't know the artists they have on the panel sometimes. And then they, they find a new artist that they like. Or sometimes in the case of you tonight, you've shared something now that I didn't know about. I, I, the name sounds really familiar. And maybe I'll, I'll know when I hear one of the songs. But I'm going to I'm going to search them out after the show tonight and hopefully find something uh, that I like. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Got it. Yeah. So here's a comment, and I want to. I need to read this one off of my itinerary because I don't want to misquote the great Brian Cranston. Uh, and this is what's really, really cool. We talked about this with both uh, Ray Seahorn and Patrick Fabian on the show a while back. And I mean, this gets talked about all the time in in the uh, the Breaking Bad uh, universe. Is the, your your music becomes a character? And I want to read the quote that Brian uh, said a while back. And he said. Um, uh, Brian, uh, he said, where is it? It says, it's been quoted as saying, with his music, Dave Porter has created another character for Breaking Bad. And of course, now that was probably prior to Better Call Saul, or maybe it was, I don't know when that was quoted, but it's a quote from Brian Cranston. And that's got to be kind of surreal for yourself, you know, because with characters, so to speak, and I don't mean to leave anybody out when I say this, but your Gus Frings, your Mike Herman Trouts, you know, your, you know, your Hector Salamanca's, your Walter White's and Skyler's, you know, you go all through the whole thing. You're bought your better calls, your Saul Goodman's. Your, your music is as important as those people. Um, it's, if I, I know it's you're a professional. That's what you do. But you're also a fan too. It's got to be kind of surreal, is it not? It certainly is. And I, you know, obviously that's a very high compliment. And I'm not sure I I even fully am on board with that. But <laughs> but I, you know, there's 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 no way that I'm as important as Brian Cranston is to the success of to Breaking Bad. Let's let's be honest. But but you know, uh, is the music important to Breaking Bad? Absolutely. And and is it important? On purpose, yes, absolutely, because I was uh, given the space uh, by by the producers of the show um, to wield music as a tool for them to help uh, tell their story in a way that was more powerful, I think, than if it had, if it hadn't had that music in it. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm very much. Um, a cog in the wheel, uh, but I, I do feel uh, that I've, I've always felt very even even in episodes where I may only have a few minutes worth of music, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is not uncommon. Um, I, I do. I've always felt very respected by this group, and and uh, and I, I will always feel like I'm of course so fortunate to be a part of it, um, but that but also thankful that that they really take the music very very seriously. It, that, that's true, and every every actor I've seen uh, do interviews. You know, they you know obviously they're there to to you know talk about them their character and their role and how they fit in with other people on on screen. But uh, more often than not, the music comes up. And it's Dave Porter, Dave Porter, Dave Porter. So it's great to see the respect, and of course, I mean you've earned it. Um, you know, it, it's just really really nice to see the the mutual respect from cast, crew, and everything. So. I am. It's, it's, I'm very fortunate to be a part of it, and and it's just it's a it's a truly great group of of, of, of folks. Yeah, it just is. You I, know, I agree. I, you've spoken to many of them. You know. Yeah. You know. I mean, there there there's uh there there's just uh, something about Vince. I think originally uh, just attracted that that kind of sensibility and that camaraderie. Uh, and then it's just only gotten more that way uh, over the years. I agree. And I think a few people that could maybe use some credit for that as well, too, for making this family and, and finding the right family and finding the right people is, of course, your Vince Gilligan's, your Peter Gould's and uh, Sharon Bialy, um, casting director. People don't realize sometimes how important and that's she, obviously another Walking Dead reference as well. She casts for uh, Walking Dead, too. Um, sure. and probably many other, I don't know her other work and unfortunately I don't I know it's probably great but these people they find the right people because you know you're spending more time with some of these folks than you do your own family you know <laughs> and it's got to it's got to work <laughs> yes it, it, it definitely does uh, last summer I, I uh, was a case in point in that when we were working on uh, the feature film El Camino mm -hmm. uh, I definitely joked that I spent way more time last summer staring at Aaron Paul than I did <laughs> my own <laughs> wife. <laughs> but uh, that's that's the gig. We, you know, it's it's a very intense for for spe specific periods of time. Um, you know, filmmaking is is uh, is very intense. Yeah, I bet. 
Uh, was it fun? Was it fun to hang out with them uh, like, while well, with the crew and that at the at the premiere? Oh yeah, it was. That was one of the the the, the capping moments for me. Uh, you know, of this whole ride, of that El Camino premiere. Uh, Netflix really went all out with it, uh, and uh, they were a great partner along with Sony Pictures Television, who produced it for Vince. And uh, you know, it just it, to to have that moment, uh, especially to have. You know, obviously, there's a lot of links between the two shows, mm-hmm. but there are some folks who are in one and not the other. To have everybody together from the whole universe is pretty rare, uh, and that was pretty special. Yeah, that was good. They really they, they brought all, all the props. They had the car. Was that the actual car from the show, or was it just a, a replica? I believe so. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, yeah. Awesome. The whole backdrop, the desert backdrop and everything, that's awesome. Uh, here's a couple questions coming in from the fans. These are great questions. Uh, so Fred Siegel says, watch any, it was more of a statement, watch any of those shows without the music and it won't have the same impact. I agree. I agree 100%. Like, it's, uh, Star Wars wouldn't be the same either without without that soundtrack. Yeah, no, certainly not. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, is m- the music for film and TV should be supportive. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very different art than making a pop record or a rock record. Uh, that needs to stand on its own. It, it is a, it is definitely a player in a in a in a joint combination of arts, you know, together that craft to make a specific thing. Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, that music is is hugely important in, in film and TV. Agreed. Now this is gonna this is gonna embarrass me for my Star Wars fandom um, because I forget which movie this was from, but I didn't, uh, from, I didn't even uh, notice this until the other day watching some making of, of Star Wars. Either it was, uh, Rise of Skywalker or The Last Jedi. Um, John Williams was featured as a cameo, uh, in, in one of the, sh- he was like one of the shopkeepers and, and, uh, they, uh, J.J. Abrams had made a props for him to sell, like had little trinkets and each one represented as like 50 years of producing, you know, they had Jaws, they had, you know, every, everything he's done was a little symbol of something you could sell in the, sh- in the store. So we got season six coming up at Better Call Saul. What, what about getting talking to uh, Peter Gould and uh, Vince Gilliam to have you do a little cameo somewhere in one of the? <laughs> See, now, now you got me thinking. Wouldn't that be great? That, now you got me thinking. You could do it, I man. Don't know, like, you know what? What it would take? You know, like what? What? What I'd have to hold over. Music. Someone. Hold them hostage. Yeah, right, right, right. Yes, right. No music unless I get a cameo. No, because they're not going to uh, go with anybody uh, else. <laughs> Say, I get a cameo or you get a test tome. You know, 440 tuning frequency. <laughs> that's it. Uh, Edwin Crane asks, um, okay, this is cool. What was it like working with uh, Brian Cranston? Is he as cool as he seems? He is. He is an absolute gentleman. He's uh, hysterically funny. Uh, I mean, he, he could... Yeah, I, I don't know enough about. Obviously, he does, you know, theater works and 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 film and TV and other things. But I mean, he's he's a he's a comedian at heart too. Yeah, uh, he brings that. Uh, but it's very uh, it, it's it's very sweet and warm, and, and he's, he just has this kind of uh, aura of of good naturedness about him. That's <clears throat> excuse me, it's impossible to ignore. Yeah, uh, is what of course makes his performance. Uh, you know, at the darkest moments of Breaking Bad, uh, ever so much more spectacular. Uh, just because it is so foreign uh, from what I see of him personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an amazing transformation he's capable of. I've seen a lot of interviews with him, you know, just kind of real nice and casual. And he's always been so complimentary of other actors and things like that. And he's learned from them as well, too. Even being a seasoned veteran like he is, he learned some... Uh, others as well, and I think that shows, you know, uh, greatness in 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 people. No matter what their talent is, whether it's a painting or music or acting, you know, learning from their peers and recognizing that's it's very important. It is. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. I before I forget this question, because I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We're about 20 minutes away from the end of the program. This was a question from um, a good friend of mine, Jay Palmer. I wrote it down. I got to find it again for a second. Um, he's he's a great. Uh, he's over in Brighton, UK. And he is, uh, you know, a guitar player and a producer and doing all kinds of things. And he just just got into scoring. And I mean, when I say just got into it, he literally just got into it. And he submitted a demo for uh, Westworld. It's like some kind of a contest that they're doing. And I, oh. forget, I forget the name of the the software plugin company. Uh, Ronit uses it. I, I don't know what it is. I could probably tell you later. Uh, but anyways, so he's using that. There, it's their contest, and you submit your material. And I just got to find it here. So yeah, he says. Um, and Westworld features uh, Aaron Paul as well, which yes. is cool. So our Jesse yep. Pinkman. I probably doesn't say bitch in that one, but 
Probably um, not. <laughs> yeah. So his question is, when Dave is composing, what inspires, I and mean, you kind of touched on this earlier, but uh, what, when Dave is composing, what inspires the mood of what he composes? Uh, the images on the movie, the show, the dialogue, the synopsis of the movie, or a combination or anything else? Yeah, I mean, we talked about that a little bit. I would say, you know, for me, as long as now I've been doing this now, um, I, I've become very visually motivated. Um, I think that um, when I'm watching something, I have such a better understanding of what all the folks before me were trying to accomplish uh, then, for example, if I was reading a script or someone was describing to me uh, what a scene would be like, could you write music to it? I honestly not, don't know how good I'd be at that anymore uh, because I've just gotten so used to um, being in, a, in the fortunate situation of, of having, uh, you know, the, the, the whatever I'm working on nearly finished before me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I just love the the nuances of how actors act. Um, one thing that is crucial I've always found is also how picture has been edited. I think you'll find, uh, we were talking about how creative people often, whether they're professional musicians or not, may have some music in their blood. Mm -hmm. I, I have found that to be very much true of uh, picture editors. And if whether they realize it or not, uh, I've always found that great picture editors are cutting to their own clock, to their own metronome. Yeah. And, and, and it, it, of course it speeds up. It varies with scene to scene and it's back, but it's, it's, it's astonishing when you, when you kind of take a scene apart and you start for me, one of the first things I do when I start to write is to throw a metronome or something to try to find a tempo that fits. Okay. And I'm always astonished in a scene uh, because it happens so often when you hit the right tempo, it just hits. It just works, almost as if someone had cut to something that was clicking, like licking away at that exact tempo, which they didn't do, of course. But internally, it's there. It's within them, and there's a rhythm to that, to the performances, and a rhythm to the, to how things are constructed. Uh, that uh, I think for me, especially because I'm a, a composer who. Um, I am more probably more rhythmically based than I am melodically based okay. in how I approach things. Uh, not that I am without melody, but but I, I, I am most interested in uh, motion and the evolution of sounds and uh, rhythms over time. Right. Because this is something that identifies music uh, as an art that's different from say a photography or a painting, just like film, right? We have that aspect of time. Uh, and so I always try to use it in some way that I can. Um, so it, it's finding that inherent beat and that pulse within what I'm working on uh, is a joy. And, and it's, it's uh, always been a fascination of mine uh, and it's very inspiring too. Pulse. You nailed it. That's that's a key word right there. It goes with the metronome, that pulse. I mean, we get our blood pressure going, you know, and yeah. we, we start getting excited and scared. And then, you know, so the soundtrack could be, you know, crazy, you know, uh, driving fear. Well, great answer. Great answer for sure. We have um, a very detailed answer too. Thank you. Paul Sura, Super Chat, uh, says, this is so cool. And I really appreciate that compliment from Paul because Paul is uh, a major fan. Uh, I got to discover him, made friends with him through uh, Patrick Fabian. So uh, thank oh, you. I appreciate that. Yeah. A couple of questions coming in as well, too. These are good ones. Uh, a really good one here from Guitar Hacks is, how does Dave find the musicians to, to uh, perform his music? Ah, excellent question. One of the benefits, obviously, of living in uh, in a New York or an L.A. or big urban centers, you have the, the benefit of, a, you know, a great community of terrific musicians. Uh, and uh, I have uh, folks that I have worked with for many, many years, decades, in some cases. Um, I tend to be very loyal to the people that I work with that I like to work with. Um, but when it comes to someone that, um, or an instrument that I don't use often, or I need somebody new, um, I usually turn to uh, my friend and engineer and guitar player, James Saez. He's uh, uh, been here in LA for a long time. He's 
worked in all kinds of worlds from TV to rock and pop. And he just, as a recording engineer, he gets cycling through his studio and others, you know, it's just a huge Rolodex of, of great folks. Uh, and he's an amazing resource for me when I need, you know, for example, uh, you know, for Saul, if I need trumpet, but I need very specifically Latin mm-hmm. fluence trumpet, right? I mean, that's a very different player than a, than a, than a classically based trumpet player to get that, that, that exact vibe. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so blessed to be here in LA with so many amazing players and, uh, and, you know, it's a community, uh, as well, you know, you think of my community within, in, in the breaking bad world, but, um, you know, there's a community here in LA of musicians and composers, both. And, and if I get stuck, uh, and James and I don't have an answer, then my next call is going to be one of one of my one of my colleagues. If it's uh, you know Sean Callery, uh, composer for Twenty Four, and or if it's uh, you know Nate Barr, you know you did from the Americans and so many other things. So these are friends of mine, and we rely on each other for for uh, you know those those insider tips mm-hmm. to find the great performers because of course. You know, music, uh, especially for an instrument that I don't particularly personally play, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they the the right performer brings so much more um, than than I could ever imagine as a composer. And they know their instruments so much better uh, that leaning on those folks uh, is always going to make you sound better Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, is definitely the trick to being a great composer. Well, like the average person has a Rolodex. If we, if people still know what Rolodexes are, you know, would go through. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm dating myself. Yeah, they go through Rolodex. Okay, B for you know. Um, right. But you've got a Rolodex of sound palettes, which is great. So okay, I, I James is busy or whatever. I got this guy here. I need a horn. I need a cello. I got it right here. That's very very cool. Um, and I'm going to come back to a question about uh, James in just a second. But I just want to mention a comment from Ed B. Says great interview, super fascinating stuff. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, so with this show normally being, for the most part, it's it's changed over the years, but it's been a guitar-centric um, show because I play guitar and, and I usually would interview guitar players. Um, sure. But it comes and goes. I mean, it's all over the place. But um, the main theme for, for Breaking Bad yep. and the outro credits uh, for um, Better Call Saul are quite yep. guitar-centric. Now, yes. was, was that James for that? And also uh, maybe a second ad- addendum to that. Was guitar mm-hmm. always the first choice for the prominent instrument there? Uh, so, in actually, uh, in those cases, they let's see. I'm have to think. Of, so, uh, when I wrote the Breaking Bad theme, we're going back uh, 12, 13 years now, uh, and I had just moved. Well, I had was still moving back and forth between LA and New York at that time, uh, and that was played by a very good friend of mine. Um, and uh, the, the um, sorry, blanking out. That's okay. The foggy moment there. Yep. But uh, uh, <clears throat> Jim Heffernan was the guy who played it, and and he played it on a um, a great big. And you're gonna you're gonna school me on this because you're so much better on the guitar knowledge than I am. Uh, but you know, a, a fully metal encased guitar, a dobro. A dobro. Right. Uh, which he tuned down and and we played very very aggressively uh, and the idea yes and the idea was was always to use that instrument uh, I knew we had it and it was something we had discussed when I was thinking about writing it and I wrote a lot of different versions of the Breaking Bad theme when we were doing that and the Dobro was only one of the options that I presented to Vince um, but it was always the winning option I think because it had that combination of uh, a little bit of that Southwest mm-hmm. vibe to it, uh, but also in the way that Jim played it, it was so brash and so loud for a for a non electrified instrument, right? Mm-hmm. And it had just sort of a brutal quality about it that we always thought of as projecting, right, where the character of Walter White was going to be. By the end of the series. Okay. So even very early on, when he's a milk toast guy, right, a chemistry teacher with you know no balls at all to speak <laughs> of, you know, he he he's we wanted to show give a little glimpse right at the beginning of every episode, uh, in the long run where this story was taking us, 
and it needed to have that sense of danger and bravado. I think um, that uh, that the, uh, the the Dobro really brought to it. Better call and this, so this and this is before I even knew James because I this was so so long ago. Right. The the Better Call Saul end credits is a, is another story too actually, and that guitar and more importantly the bass are both played by another friend, a great friend of mine named Adam Dorn. Okay. Uh, and he's a composer also in his own right, uh, but a fantastic bass player. Uh, and uh, I brought him on um, when we were starting to think about uh, that first season of Better Call Saul. One of the things I had been tasked with um, when we began the show, and in fact, everybody on the whole production pretty much was sit, was told, whatever you do, this has to be different. Yeah. Right? It's got to be different from Breaking Bad. It's got to be a whole new world. Uh, and uh, that's a lot easier said than done when you're coming off a show that's been very successful and you're all the same people working together. Yeah. The habit is to fall back right into things. So uh, so the, one of the things I did was I, was I brought on Adam to kind of help me work through the process. And he played bass on an awful lot of Better Call Saul in the first couple seasons when the show was lighter and a little funkier and crazier and fun, you know, mm -hmm. uh, now I think as the score has progressed closer and closer to that uh, Breaking Bad timeline, uh, the music has evolved closer to that way, too. And so there's been a little bit less of that. But the supreme example of that vibe is 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 the one you 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 mentioned, which is that the end credits for, yeah. for the for the Saul. And that's a. That's a, uh, uh, a version that uh, Adam and I did together, uh, but, uh, but he's playing all the strength parts there. Okay. Well, yep. I'm, I'm glad you, I've, I had a little geeky moment, like a little like yes moment just for a second, because I always thought that might have been a dobro, you know, like, and I remember even trying to do some slide guitar to duplicate it, you know, like watching the show, uh -huh. you know, be, you know, just jam or whatever. So I thought it might have been a dobro. I had no idea. But here's something, and I'm being, trying to be very uh, close with the time here as well, too. 9.52, we got about eight minutes left. My son said something today was very, very cool. And I've noticed this, especially in the Breaking Bad world, the main the main title theme and a lot of little cues that you'll do here and there have a, uh, and this is this is my ignorance of not knowing what you do, but a percussive tone to it. And I don't know if it's like, a, sometimes it sounds like a steel drum or, um, uh, or maybe a dulcimer or some kind of percussive hammer type instrument. But he said mm -hmm. to me, and I thought this was really cool. He says, it makes me feel like, you know, well, maybe they went with that. Maybe Dave went with that because Breaking Bad, they're using all the beakers and, and you know, jars and things like, and they're making noise and there's, you know, hammering and just to give you that feeling of that. But I, I thought, I don't think it has full merit to what the show was about, but I thought mm -hmm. it was a really cool statement. But what are yep. some of the percussive elements that you've used in that theme specifically? Well, I love percussion, and I and I have, there's so much of it in in both shows, uh, and particularly in Breaking Bad, um, almost all the percussion in there started as one thing, and then got processed in the computer to become something else. So there's so much after the fact processing that went on from the original recordings, to specifically to try to make it, I think, uh, not necessarily recognizable as an instrument that your ear would know. Um, but not altogether unfamiliar in a synthetic way. Hopefully it still has, a, you know, the organic quality of something that was played. Uh, as I moved into Better Call Saul, particularly those early seasons, um, there's a lot more pretty straight and live percussion, um, hand drums. And, and, and I love, of course, if, if you listen to, um, I think particularly in my score for El Camino, mm -hmm. uh, Tons of usage of of um, of mallet instruments, right? Tuned percussion, percussion that 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 you can. As me as a keyboard player, right? I'm very familiar with. Oh, piano is nothing but a percussion instrument, right? True. It, with with tuned things that you whack on. Yeah. You know, that's I mean, that's that's the basis of it, and uh, and so uh, for me, I think it's a natural. Uh, fit the percussive stuff and the and the keyboard stuff, uh, and also have found that you know in the kind of music that I do, which does tend to be on the sparer side, probably from, from as most people would consider it. There's a beauty in that percussive nature of things because it it musically says something, uh, and then it gets out of the way okay. very quickly, right? 
uh, which leaves a lot of air uh, and it leaves a lot of space to do other things or interweave different percussive and melodic elements. And also, if you're you know thinking as a film or a television poser, uh, it's useful to leave that space for other things. Dialogue. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're in a car and there's a constant drone of an engine, or uh, sirens, right, which are constant in Breaking <laughs> Bad and El Camino, right, uh, th those things that helps you cut through and and um, be able to make your point musically. I think such valuable inf insider information. Like, I mean, I, I know fans right now are loving this, and people that d didn't see the video tonight, they'll watch it back and rediscover it. They'll get some great tips on how. You know, the, experiencing this now from the other side of it, I really appreciate the information. Um, just before we get ready to wrap up here, we've got about four more minutes left. So it, we'll, do, we'll do two things here. One, the fact that, I mean, obviously meeting uh, Vince Gilligan years back and striking up a friendship, you know, years ago, and now working, I mean, you probably at one time didn't think you'd even submit, be able to submit one piece of work to him, let alone work on every single project he's done since. That's got to be amazing. But I know both Ray and Patrick said, Right about now, uh, you know, the crew would be out there, you know, shooting uh, season six. So obviously the pandemic has put a bit of a, uh, uh, a hold on things. And, and hopefully that gets back to normal as, as close to normal as soon as they can do that. But and I don't want to, you know, ask for any spoilers. But are you are you um, composing right now for season six? Oh, no, 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 no. It's going to be no, a while no. yet. Yeah, long, uh, 2021. Really? Yeah, I, I, I would assume. Uh, I mean, you know, with the there's a, we have a long ways to go, and before I mean, I, and I'm no expert in this, so mm -hmm. just nobody quote me. But just from my what I'm hearing from around town is that you know the most important next step, uh, in addition, of course, to you know not seeing any huge flare-ups of the virus, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, a framework that's gonna that's got to be created between the various unions and the guilds. Uh, for for the safety of the, of the crew uh, on the sets, uh, and they haven't ironed that out yet. And I think that's 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 a hurdle. They got to figure out how to do that because it's it's a very complicated machine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you've ever watched, you know, something getting produced for film, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of you know talented folks that have to work in harmony to make that work. Uh, so I, I think we're a ways away from that. And then as I as I mentioned before, just in because of the, the nature of the way um, that the quality control is so high on on Better Call Saul in, mm -hmm. in particular, um, you know the writers Tom and 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 uh, Peter and everybody, they're they're going to want to be present for every aspect of it. Yeah. So they're, they're going to want to be working hard writing. Then they're going to want to be there in the flesh in Albuquerque while it all gets shot. Uh, and then they're going to come home to L.A. and we're going to do the post. And it just there's no unfortunately, I, you know, I, I get lots of emails all the time uh, about where where's the next Better Call Saul. And we got this on Breaking Bad all the time, too. And, yeah. And, you know, I understand it and I understand people's frustrations with it. But I also know without a shadow of a doubt, uh, the reason that the quality on these shows is so high is, of course, because of so many uh, brilliant people, and I'm not lumping myself in there, but who work on these shows uh, and write them and create them especially, uh, but in the time they take to get them right. Yeah. You just, you just can't rush it. You can't. Uh, and, it, and, the, and the quality is, is, is uh, you know, there's so much TV getting made right now, right? There's so many new outlets for TV. Mm -hmm. And while TV is so much better than it used to be, uh, I think there's a real danger in in the speed at which uh, f all these new networks and streaming services are are clamoring to get this content out there um, that some of these shows aren't as polished as they could be. Yeah. Uh, and, and and that's a shame. Yeah. That's I, a shame. I, I agree for, with for that. all involved. I think, you know, it's uh, it's better to better, better to practice the patience. Uh, and and be rewarded with with the with the best result. Agreed. And right now it all comes down to safety. Everyone's got to be safe. Same thing over in the rock and roll world too. Touring has been stopped worldwide. And even when sure. it resumes next year, if it does resume whatever time next year, there's the the inevitables like the insurances. I mean, what, is it going to be crazy premiums? We don't know, right? right. So so many more new things and hurdles and costs. I know we're all learning. Everyone's learning. Yeah. 
Uh, Adapting. Last point from a uh, comment from Paul Sura says the marriage between the way the video was edited, edited and the music during the scene uh, where Jesse was scouring Todd's condo uh, in El Camino. That was insane. Uh, right. A great end result, he says. Thank you. That was Appreciate that was something else. As we wrap up here, and again, this is no spoilers asking, um, anything you might be doing with Vince Gilligan down the road? Is, has there been any talk there for anything at all or nothing that you know of or maybe hopeful? No. You know, I haven't seen Vince in a while uh, because uh, we, we wrapped Better Call Saul a few months ago. And then, you know, obviously we've all been sequestered into our homes mm-hmm. <laughs> quite a while. So uh, I owe him an email, see what he's up to these days. I, I know that he's going to be... Um, uh, back and and uh, extra involved in this last season of Better Call Saul, Great. so I imagine that that's going to be uh, be uh, largely his focus uh, from here. And and I think all of us are are very zeroed in on that. This is the this is going to be the crowning season, you know, of a universe that that those guys have been working and creating, and I've been blessed to work on for well over a decade. Uh, and we, we, we're, we're, we're very determined to stick the landing. Yeah. So, uh, I think that's, that's priority number one in the future. I certainly, uh, I certainly hope to work with Vince on, on new stuff and as, as well as Peter and so many of the other friends that I have and, uh, who work on these shows, uh, they, I think they all have, uh, some great new stuff in them. And I think personally, it'd be fun to, as much as I love and adore every moment of my Breaking Bad universe, be fun to explore some new territory with these folks. Yeah, yeah. Something really different. Uh, and uh, if I'm lucky enough to get to do that, I'll be I'll be doubly blessed. Well, let's fingers crossed because I, I think you're. I mean, you guys have got a great relationship, and and I know Vince counts on you. He knows he can count on you. Though, if he says, okay, well, he already told you, you know, him and Peter, this guy, uh, Better Call Saul's got to be different than Breaking Bad. So if they go into it, maybe it's some kind of sci-fi thing. They know you can do it. Let's hope. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank you so, so much for your valuable time tonight. This has been great. Something I've wanted to do for a very, very long time. I want to thank your staff over at White Bear uh, Public Relations as well, too. Fantastic people there. Uh, I think it was Andrew and Chandler been speaking with. Uh, great people. Thank you so very, very much. And I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. But everyone, um, if you haven't seen uh, the season five of Better Call Saul, it was a great, great season. Or maybe if you haven't even caught up that far, start watching it. It's fantastic. Then when you've done that, go back and watch Breaking Bad all over again and catch up with El Camino. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, throw some thumbs up for Dave Porter here. And Dave, we'll say goodbye to you off the air. And uh, everyone, we'll see you very, very soon. We'll be live over in the Helix Hour this Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, with Paul Heinmarsh joining in Talking Pod Go. Until next time, everyone, thank you so very, very much, and cheers. Hey, you're still here? Eric Jr. here, reminding you to check out our full lineup of quality merch, available right now in the Broadstash Boutique. Quality products and fast shipping. Visit broadstash.com today. Video production services for Rock Shop Live are provided by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for Rock Shop Live are provided by Rode Microphones.